evening, everyone. Welcome to the <laughs> September Hoboken Board of Education meeting. Ms. Good, can you please read the statement of compliance? This meeting is being held in conformity to the Open Public Meeting Act, NJSA 10 colon 4-6. Proper public notice of the meeting was published in the local papers on December 26, 2020 and January 2, 2021. If any board member or member of the public in attendance believe that the meeting is in violation of the Open Public Meetings Act, the Hoboken Board of Education requests that they make a statement at this time. The board wishes to make those in attendance aware that this meeting is being recorded on video and will be broadcast by the board at a later date on CATV Channel 77 and Files Channel 46. The full meeting recording will also be made available on board docs, which can be accessed through the district homepage. The Hoboken Board of Education is committed to preserving the decorum of the public process and is mindful that we live in the electronic age of computers, cell phones, and other electronic communication devices. Nevertheless, we respectfully request that all meeting participants kindly silence their electronic devices during the course of the meeting, and if use of the device is necessary, we ask that you please leave the meeting room if you need to conduct personal business. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we take the roll call, please? Ms. Catamatori. Here. Ms. Zalera. Here. Mr. Delator. Here. Ms. Kana. Here. Mr. Kluckful. Here. Ms. McGurk. Here. Ms. Simon. Here. Ms. Takarian. Here. Ms. Angley. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Dr. Johnson. Okay. Uh, good evening. I just want to provide a brief report regarding the opening of school. Um, so we opened school last Thursday um, at all of our elementary schools, our middle school and our high school. Uh, the first couple of days of school were um, pretty typical from the perspective of making sure that schedules were in place, making some changes with schedules that needed to be made. Um, we were are working with a new food service provider, so some of those changes have been um, uh, somewhat typical when you switch from in one provider to another provider, but we're working with uh, Chartwells actually right now. Uh, before the school year started, we uh, tested a little over 2,600 uh, students and staff. Uh, I had reported out to the board at one point that we had three positive cases in that group um, and of students and one positive uh, case of an, an adult. We are set uh, to test again this coming Friday. Um, happy to report out that our staff, uh, total staff uh, vaccination rate is 95.4%. Um, and so that's kind of contributing to the numbers of individuals uh, that we're, we're testing. Um, I want to report out to the board that all of our back to school nights are set and um, are uh, coming up soon. We have Brant School, which is happening on September 21st. We have Wallace School that's happening on September 28th. Um, 23rd, we have the middle school on September 28th, the high school on September 29th, and we have Connor School on September 30th. So at all of those back to school nights, what will happen is uh, we will not have our traditional gathering in the auditoriums or the gymnasiums. Instead, our principals will do a pre-recorded um, message that will be provided to all of the faculty members so parents will uh, report directly to their child's um, teacher's classroom, homeroom teacher's classroom, uh, and then they will get a greeting both from the teacher as well as the uh, school administrator, and then they will have time in the classroom. Um, we think that kind of cutting down the travel time from one location to another will provide parents with more time 
in uh, the classroom. Uh, at our high school level, um, at the beginning of the school year, one of the things that always is exciting is that our sports programs get underway. Um, our football team will be starting their season uh, shortly, but our girls' volleyball team is underway, the girls' new girls' tennis team is underway, and both boys' and girls' soccer is underway. Uh, this past spring, we talked a lot about new courses that were added to the program of studies. So we have um, a whole host of pre-AP courses that have already been rolled out and started at the middle school and the high school level. Um, our middle school physics program um, has started and all of our teachers have been trained. And our elementary schools um, will be implementing a young citizens uh, curriculum through the Center for Civic Education. Uh, and teachers have been trained in that as well. Um, this evening, we do have two student council members here from Hoboken High School. Typically, you will see Andrew Castellan. He's the president of the student council. He will come to each meeting to present out some of the exciting things that are happening at uh, the high school. Um, but this evening, uh, we are uh, pleased um, to have two of our student council reps, Gabby, who is the vice president, and also Tony, who's the secretary that's here. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over for Gabby to come on up and give us an overview of what's happening at the high school. Oh, and I see Sheila's here, too. Uh, hello. It's on. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I just want to formally introduce myself. Um, I am uh, Gabriela Velez, the Vice President for Hoboken High School Student Government. Uh, this is Sheila Lamb, our President. Um, and this is Tony Antonia Fucci, our uh, secretary. And like um, Dr. Johnson said, I do uh, cur currently filling in for Andrew Castlin, who is our uh, board representative, currently isn't able to make it today. Um, so the Hoboken High School Student Government and Hoboken High School Student Activities Office has hit the ground running to begin our new school year. Uh, tomorrow, September 15th, the Hoboken Hispanic Culture Club will be hosting uh, an Hispanic Hispanic Heritage Flag Racing at 11.20 a.m. in front of the Hoboken High School to kick off the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. All are invited to attend. Um, the theater department will be holding auditions on Monday, September 20th at 3.30 p.m. for the play 12 Angry Jurors. Um, there are 12 angry men and 12 angry uh, women versions. We will produce a co-ed version and call it Jurors. Uh, while this play is a 1954 classic, we will approach it with a modern twist. Um, it is compelling drama filled with the complexities of the judicial system. Twelve Angry Men strips humanity down to the most basic ingredients about seeking justice in a world filled with prejudice. Ironically, these themes seem as vital, as vital now as when the play was written. Students do not need to prepare anything for this audition. We hope to see everyone there. Uh, the student council officers are also looking for um, their are looking forward to their monthly luncheon with the Hoboken High School administration that will be happening sometime later this week. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to foster a positive working relationship between the student government and Hoboken High School administration. Working together is what makes Hoboken High School such a special place. Uh, the Hoboken High School student government will be holding uh, student government class council elections on September 24th, 2021. There will be 10 openings for the position per grade level for those who would like to represent their class and become a part of the student government. As representatives, students will work closely with the current members and attend our monthly meetings to discuss and plan student and community activities throughout this year. There will also be an election for on that day for our last officer position, which is uh, the student government treasurer. Elections, uh, election results will be announced on Monday, uh, September 27, 2021. On Thursday, October 7, 2021, 
The Hoboken High School student government will host an Italian American heritage flag raising at Hoboken High School at 11.30 a.m. All are invited to attend. And finally, to round up this report, the student council will be hosting a homecoming pep rally at JFK Stadium on Friday, October 8th, as 20, uh, 2021, as to prepare to take on Shabazz High School for our uh, annual homecoming game. We will honor all of our student athletes for our fall sports programs at this pep rally. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today, and we look forward to seeing you guys at our events. Go Red Wings! <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, okay, Ms. Good, do you have a business administrator's report no, tonight? Good. No. Uh, next, we'll move on to committee reports, and we'll start with curriculum. Ms. Kana. Good evening. The curriculum committee met on Thursday, September 9th at 11 a.m. In attendance were Dr. Johnson, Ms. Katamatori, Ms. McGurk, Mr. Klupfel, and myself. There are no action items on the agenda. Our staff completed their curriculum training over the summer. Our district will be offering a number of community athletic programs, including punt pass, competitions, soccer skills competition, hockey skills clinic, the volleyball skills clinic, basketball, baseball, and softball skills. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Moving on to facilities, Ms. Simons. The Facilities Committee met virtually on Thursday, September 9th. In attendance were Dr. Johnson, Mr. Callaghi, Ms. Katamatori, Ms. Delara, Mr. De La Torre, and myself. Uh, we recommend the approval of a new custodian on the agenda today. And the following items were reviewed. Um, the Hoboken High School has completed the installation of their fresh air units. Brant and Connor schools are waiting on par parts and will be installed in two weeks. Air purifiers have also been installed. Um, the buildings have a strict sanitizing schedule. The bathrooms are um, sanitized multiple times a day using an electrostatic spray. And classrooms are continuously sanitized. Doorknobs and other high touch areas are also at least sanitized three times a day. Thank you. Thank you. Finance, Mr. Delatore. Yep. Finance committee. Um, governance, Ms. McGurk. The Governance Committee met virtually on Thursday, pardon me, my notes went away, Thursday, September 9th at 5.30 p.m. In attendance were Ms. Katamatori, Ms. Kana, Mr. Kirian, Superintendent Dr. Johnson, and myself. I'd like to say a big welcome back to all of our faculty and staff for the 2021-2022 school year. We reviewed all agenda items uh, for the tonight's meeting and recommend all for board approval. Happy to report out that all certificated positions are filled for the 2021-2022 school year and that our new teachers were matched with mentors and enjoyed an off-site bonding event last week. And that's all from governance personnel. Thank you. And wellness, Ms. Delera. Sure. The wellness committee met on September 9th. In attendance were uh, Ms. Simons, Ms. Kana, Ms. Angley, and Superintendent Dr. Johnson and myself. Um, Dr. Johnson touched on a few of the reopening uh, updates regarding vaccinations and testing. Uh, we also talked about chart world menus and um, some more changes coming for the following months. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't really have a report tonight, but I'd like to welcome everyone back. It's hard to believe summer is over and September is here already. Um, I would like to thank our administration, teachers, staff, and families for a successful opening of school. As you all know, last year the Hoboken Public School District was successful in reopening five days per week for in-person learning, something many districts throughout the country could not do. This year, the district has built upon that success and has expanded its reopening plan to ensure the safety of our students and staff. None of this could happen without the tireless efforts of Dr. Johnson and her team. We are truly appreciative. Um, moving on, we will go now to public comments on agenda items. Not 
Okay. Uh, consent agenda. Is okay, can you sign up, please? Is, is this is this on an agenda item or just um, there? There's two options for you to speak on agenda items, and then in a few minutes we'll just be um, non-agenda items. If you'd sure. like to, I'll just sign up and I'll wait till I guess non-agenda items. Okay. Okay. So if that's the case, then we can move to consent agenda. Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Can we have the roll call, please? Move <clears throat> Roll call. Roll call, please. Ms. Catamatori? Yes. Ms. Zalera? Yes. Mr. Delator? Yes. Ms. Connor? Yes. Mr. Clubful? Yes. Ms. McGurk? Yes. Ms. Simon? Yes. Ms. Sakarian? Yes. Ms. Angley? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so now we'll move on to public comments on agenda and non-agenda items. Uh, for each speaker, please state your name and uh, municipality of residence, um, and you have five minutes to speak. Uh, my name is Donna McGinn. Um, I live in Hoboken. So, <clears throat> facts don't seem to matter anymore. So, I guess it doesn't matter that I can tell you that the potential educational harms of mandatory masking policies are much more firmly established than their possible benefits in stopping the spread of COVID-19 in schools. I can tell you that in 18 months, the number of children who have died from COVID is 412. Well over, well over 950 have died from pneumonia in that same period of time. I can tell you that no scientific consensus exists about the wisdom of mandatory masking rules for school children. I can tell you that little kids fidget with their masks, they chew on them, they pull them down, and generally they wear them completely improperly. I can also tell you that the survival rate among American children with confirmed COVID cases is approximately 99.99%. I can tell you that masking children is a psychological stressor and that covering half their face disrupts their ability to communicate. Hygiene theater and exposed capricious COVID policy doesn't matter either. So it doesn't matter that I can tell you that immediately following school, many of these same kids go to indoor and outdoor playdates and they eat in restaurants without masks. I can tell you that masks can be removed when it's too hot because apparently COVID doesn't exist above a certain temperature. I can tell you that in Spain, masks are used in kids ages six and older. If masks provided a large benefit, then the transmission rate among five-year-olds would be higher than the rate among six-year-olds. The results, however, do not show that. Instead, they show that transmission rates, which were low among the youngest kids, is steadily increased with age rather than dropping sharply for older children subject to the face covering requirement. Being that when the facts are staring us in the face with about 18 months worth of proof, and we continue to double down on an unproven universal medical intervention for children unilaterally, we are asking for you to meet us at least somewhere in the middle. We want to know the psychological implications of prolonged mask use in children. We propose that we do this through tracking and transparency. Teachers and parents should be able to report issues such as mask tics, acne, eye irritation, or any other form of distress. We need to know our children are okay and cannot simply assume they are fine because they are compliant and put their masks on when we tell them to. 
We have a duty of care and I don't believe we are checking in on them. Please stop telling us children are resilient without knowing if they really are. Obedience is not the same as resilience. We want to ensure their dental hygiene is cared for. We propose an option for children to brush their teeth after they eat before putting on their masks. Masks trap the bacteria inside their mouth and can cause severe cavities. Communication around masks outdoors. The EO states children do not need to wear masks outdoors and yet our children are being told to keep their masks on by staff. We ask that you send communication to parents making it clear masks are optional outside. If parents request for masks to be removed outside, we expect the, sta the staff to allow this. We want more water breaks. Masks give children the notion that they are a permanent fixture on their faces and many parents say that their children's water bottles come home full and they are exceedingly thirsty after school. We want them outside more. More outdoor time means more mask breaks. We want to know which metric will be used to determine when these mitigation measures will become the choice of the parent. How about three positives out of 2,600 tested? What is the benchmark for removing these additional restrictions on testing and quarantine after travel? We're not here to ask the board to take our concern under consideration. Cooperation and collaboration is what we expect and what we deserve. These are our children. We are afraid for them. We are feeling powerless to make medical decisions for them as their parents. There are other school districts fighting for reason and for actual science, yet Hoboken has chosen to double down and go for extra credit beyond the executive order. We ask to meet in the middle. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, and thank you, board members. Uh, my name is Donnie DeSani. Uh, I'm a father of two boys, uh, one attending kindergarten at Wallace and uh, one across the street at a twos program. Uh, as we enter a new school year, we are coming off of a summer uh, that looked like the start of return to normalcy. Uh, Hoboken was in full swing with restaurants and bars back to full capacity. Summer events and gatherings resumed, as well as other businesses up and running with little to no limitations. Our neighboring city also had restaurants and bars to full capacity, spilling into the streets, sporting events, concerts, and gatherings, hosting thousands of people with little to no restrictions or masks. Yet somehow now, a room of 10 children are required to wear a spit, sweat, snot, soaked rag over their nose for seven hours a day because they are considered a risk. How does this make any sense? I understand the mass debate has opposing sides, but if we look at controlled scientific studies, there's little data to support the effectiveness of masks. A study published in the Southern Medical Journal did an analysis of the effects of COVID-19 mass mandates on hospital resource consumption and mortality. Data was collected from 100,000 population bases studying the, excuse me, the rise of corona cases and deaths before and after mass, state mass mandates. The conclusion was there was no reduction in daily mortality or hospitalization admittance attributed to the implementation of mass mandates. The study goes on to state, quote, multiple systematic reviews of the existing literature concluded that there is insufficient evidence to demonstrate medical cloth and masks prevent infection. Now, these studies were done with medical masks and showed insufficient evidence of their effectiveness. What is to say that little Susie's sparkle-studded mask or little Jimmy's Paw Patrol mask is doing anything at all? We hear your hands are tied with the state mandates, but we, we as parents are concerned and we feel you need to be made aware and accountable of possible negative effects these masks are having on our children. What started as 14 days to flatten the curve has now turned into a two-year medical experiment without our consent of prolonged use of masks in children. And as the statistics show repeatedly, children are the least likely to be affected by the COVID virus. As stated in the CDC data tracker this week, since April 2020, there has been zero deaths reported in children due to COVID. I've spoken with numerous parents in town who have seen firsthand some of these effects on their children. The stories are heartbreaking. What they have seen included increased anxiety, headaches, skin rashes, consistent sore throats, fatigue, and bacterial infection. One mom shared how her daughter vomited in her mask and refused to take it off out of fear that she would get in trouble. Another alarming concern that needs to be recognized is what other contaminants are these masks collecting throughout the day? Mask wearing in a, mask wearing in a sterile surgery room is one thing, but, full of children, but, but that does not carry over to a classroom setting full of children who are touching everything including their face. This past June, the University of Florida did an analysis of the masks of six parents after they, had, after they had been worn. The resulting report found that five masks were contaminated with bacteria, parasites, and fungi, 
including three with dangerous pathogenic bacteria and pneumonia-causing bacteria. Other pathogens were identified that could cause fever, ulcers, yeast infections, strep throat, acne, and periodontal disease. Which brings up, brings up another interesting concern you may not have thought of, oral health. Parents are sharing how their children's dentists have reported an increase of cavities in children this past year. Dentists believe this to be because the prolonged wearing of masks encourages mouth breathing, which in turn is drying out children's masks, mouths and setting up an environment for unhealthy bacteria that can lead to tooth decay. Now these side effects are certainly disheartening, but my main concern is how the prolonged use of these masks are affecting the most essential nutrient to all living things on this planet, that's oxygen. A study on the respiratory consequences of N95 masks on pregnant healthcare workers found that even during low intensity activity, wearing the N95 masks reduced their normal volume of air displaced by 23%. And this was only after 15 minutes of low intensity activity. Now one can argue that these studies were done using N95 masks. True, but they're also being done on grown adults for only 15 minutes. What about a young, undeveloped child wearing a mask for seven hours a day? How is even the smallest reduction in oxygen affecting brain development, motor skills, proper organ function, and learning abilities? In 100 years of health science, we can do better than telling our children to wear a mask. We must do better. If this is about the health of our children, then look into better ways to cre create prevention. Plenty of air filter options are available to remove viruses. Inform our children how to develop a robust, a robust immune system through nutrition and better food choices. Give the children more exposure to more sunlight and outside activities. Vitamin D deficiency has been a common occurrence in many COVID patients. For some reason, my child's class did not go outside the other day when it was 80 degrees and sunny. Promote more exercise and moving in the day to increase T cells, which support a healthy immune system. Another reason why children seem to be more immune to COVID is their high T cell levels. These are fundamental elements to better health that have stood the test of time. Now is the time to lean on them even more. When it comes to these masks, the risk is not worth the reward. We encourage you as the board members to push back on these mandate mandates as other districts have. Help us to unmask our children and allow them to breathe again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Just, just a reminder, we all have to, it may sound, uh, but we all have to be masked in the board meeting. So if you don't mind keeping it I on. Mean, I'm, while I speak, I'll back up if you want. It's, okay. it's just a mandate from the oh, governor. We he have didn't to, have a mask on the whole time. I, I, can, I know, I didn't want to interrupt him, but, but I'm just asking I'm you if you could keep it on. Well, um, so if you could please keep I'm, it on. I'll, I'll stand wherever you want. I'm, I'm, if, if you could just keep just, the mask on, that's all no, I'm asking. No, I can't. No, I mean... Uh, it's not my rule. It's just the. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm standing eight feet from everybody. I'm, I just, I, like, just want to be able to articulate a word the whole time. I'll wear it when I sit down. If I can speak for four minutes without a mask, I'd appreciate it. So I can articulate what I'm Again, saying. Again, it's not my rule. I'm asking you to just keep the mask on. It's the policy. It's not my policy. If you don't mind. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in Hoboken for 18 years. Um, I've had my kids in the Hoboken public school system um, from the very beginning. And currently, my oldest daughter's in seventh grade middle school, my youngest daughter's in uh, fourth oh. at Wallace. Sorry, yeah. sorry, back up. Um, can you please state your name? And oh, name? Nick, my name is Nick Colvin, sorry. Um, and uh, we love this town, um, everything that's unique about it and the community and the place in which we live, um, and that's why we've never left. My wife has been a school teacher for 21 years in West Orange, uh, so I do have a special appreciation for the work that all of you put in, and that goes into being teachers, school administrators, professionals, and board members. I know it's not easy, especially in the environment we're in today. Last year, I know it was especially rough, uh, while other towns and municipalities in New Jersey and around the nation were unmitigated disasters. Hoboken handled everything beautifully, um, as well as any district in the country, in fact, from, from everything I've heard. And trust me, your efforts uh, were appreciated in my household and many others. Uh, but now we're on a new school year, and we seem to be going backwards. And my question is why? We're in a political environment, the likes of which I haven't seen in my lifetime. And we are all being divided in a manner that is quite frankly petrifying. This country is walking a tightrope and it's dangerously close to falling off the edge if things don't change quickly. 
Children unequivocally are the least impacted by this virus. It's been that way from the beginning, and I'm quite certain almost everyone can agree on that. So why must they be masked all day at school while football stadiums can be packed with 100,000 people all over the country? Our children should not be used because of our irrational fears over a virus that has proven to affect them similar to the seasonal flu and that is treatable via drugs like ivermectin and hydrochloroquine. Although I know the mainstream media doesn't want you to know that, but that's a fact. The seasonal flu doesn't exist anymore since COVID cases um, came about. Um, if you weren't aware of that, it went from 38 million cases in 2019 for the flu to 2,000 in 2020. So I guess I would ask you to think about that. And moreover, what are we testing? And with what, with what tests? Because last I checked, the FDA did a class one recall on the PCR test, the one that was considered the gold standard for this entire pandemic. The reason it was recalled, because it's now been realized that the PCR positive tests were also showing for the seasonal flu and common cold viruses in the PCR test. And that's our data, and that's the science. No, the flu didn't go away because we were wearing masks. It conveniently went away to drive up COVID cases by tens of millions. We cannot continue to ignore the Constitution and our rights as citizens of this country. It's the foundation of this country, and our children should know the freedom just like we did growing up. Coronavirus is no longer, if you believe it ever was, an emergency. Politicians are weaponizing this state of emergency to assert power and control, and we've had enough. And most importantly, our children have had enough. Do we really think it's healthy and just fine that our kids are breathing in their own microbacteria all day with spit, sweat, and snot piled up in a mask pressing against their nose and mouth? Do we really think that restricted oxygen levels in conjunction with escalated carbon monoxide intake all day long is a good thing for their health? Then, of course, the psychological and emotional damage of mass care children. The numbers for suicides, depression, and anxiety are all there. And we know the pandemic, along with the measures that have been mandated of children, have been profound and, jump, and made those numbers jump through the roof. Children need to see smiles. They need to hug. They need to see facial expressions for cognitive reasons for younger kids, as well as emotional for older ones. Masks are used in oppressive societies and countries around the world to strip dignity, individuality, creativity, and is a form of degradation and punishment. Is this really what our kids deserve? Is it really so necessary to keep us all safe? Local governance, governance is the real power here. You have the power to push back if you choose on the Murphy mandates that do not, that do not need to embrace this town. All we ask is that you consider our positions and if your heart, you agree with, it, with anything, that you take action. We're counting on you. Our kids are counting on you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. OK. Uh, the board will be going into executive session uh, for the purpose of discussing legal items. Uh, we will be approximately 30 minutes and will not be taking action uh, afterwards, so we will be coming back to close the meeting. Um, do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Catamatori. Yes. Ms. Delira. Yes. Mr. Delator. Yes. Ms. Connor. Mr. Klutpool? Yes. Ms. McGurk? Yes. Ms. Simon? Yes. Ms. Sikarian? Yes. Ms. Angley? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, it is now 818 and we are just coming out of executive session. Do I have a motion to resume the meeting? Motion. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Katamatori? Yes. Ms. Delira? Yes. Mr. Delator? Yes. Ms. Kana? Yes. Mr. Klupful? Yes. Ms. McGurk? Yes. Ms. Simons? Yes. Mr. Kirian? Yes. Ms. Angley? Yes. Motion passes. And with no further business, do I have a motion to close the meeting? Motion. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That concludes our meeting. Meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm.